and thank you all for thank you all for joining from your various locations by way of introduction my name is Anna Langera Tambua and I have the absolute pleasure of being your facilitator for the webinar this morning so on behalf of International Ideas Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific again I welcome you all who have joined us for the second webinar of Democratic Development in Melanesia webinar series 2023 uh, we would like to welcome all of our panelists and our participants um, to this morning's webinar. It's morning in Fiji, it's evening in England. Uh, one of our panelists is, is joining us from the United Kingdom uh, this morning. So as part of International Ideas Asia and the Pacific Regional Programs Work Plan for 2023, these webinars aim to provide opportunities to citizens of the Melanesia region to take part in substantive discussions around democracy in Melanesia. It's also intended that through this, the webinars, citizens of Melanesian countries who participate may be able to gain knowledge on the subject matter and on the experiences of other countries. This will in turn enhance debates on institutional and procedural improvements in their respective democracies. So the second webinar is titled Municipal Elections in Fiji, Some Legal and Practical Considerations. As we all know, Fiji's experienced a challenging political history, which is marked by four coups and political instability. And the last local government elections were held in 2005. And since then, the municipal councils have been run by appointed administrators. The local government structure in Fiji consists of four divisions and 13 municipalities, each with its own council. The councils are responsible for a range of services, including garbage collection, town planning, beautification, and road maintenance. The new Fijian government intends to hold local government elections in September, October, 2023. However, there are concerns that this may not be a realistic timeline to hold local government elections from scratch. The 2013 constitution does not have any provision for local government elections. Now in this respect, International IDEA commissioned a paper to take into account the legislations that are, that are in force currently. Just some house rules for the webinar this morning. We will have three speakers who will deliver their presentations first, and then we will open the, the webinar up to the audience for around 30 minutes to ask questions after the three speakers have presented. The audience can use the raise hand feature to ask questions, or if you would like to, you could drop your questions in the chat feature. And what we're asking, please, is that you keep your mics off during the webinar and only turn it on before you ask any questions. Um, before we proceed any further, please note that this session is being recorded and it will be published by International IDEA in their social media channels. Um, colleagues, we also have a disclaimer from International Idea that the statements, views, opinions expressed in the presentation do not necessarily represent the institutional position of International Idea, its board of advisors, or its council of member states. And I'll just introduce the panelists briefly and we'll invite our first panelist to, to provide his presentation. Our first uh, panelist this morning is a senior elections consultant from International Idea, Mr. Andrew Ellis, who's a um, consultant advisor on the design and implementation of electoral systems and processes and of constitutional frameworks. Successively head of electoral processes, director of operations and founder, Asia and the Pacific director of International Idea, Andrew has edited and contributed to many IDEA electoral handbooks, including those covering electoral system design, electoral management design, voting from abroad, direct democracy, and electoral justice. He has worldwide experience as a technical advisor in democratic transitions, including long-term assignments in Indonesia, Cambodia, Bosnia, and Palestine. Good evening, Andrew, and welcome to the webinar. We also have the pleasure of the presence of the Permanent Secretary, Ms. Seema Sharma the, from the Ministry of Local Government. Uh, welcome Seema. And we're also joined by Nilesh Lal, who is the Executive Director for Dialogue Fiji. Welcome Nilesh. I'll hand straight over to you, Andrew, for your presentation. Binaka.
Thank you, Anna. Can everybody hear me as well enough? We can hear you very well. Excellent. And thank you very much for the invitation to present at today's webinar a few thoughts in an important process of democratisation, a process which um, I value not only in itself, but remembering a slightly further back part of uh, my career when I served for four years as an elected councillor on a local authority in the north of England, representing uh, a you know, fairly poor ward in the middle of the city of Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, from that first hand experience, um, I very much emphasise the, the role that local government and locally elected government can play in improving the lives of citizens. May I start the presentation, which I will just get up on screen now and And share. I hope the, um, the the slides are now up on screen. By yes, saying that credible and legitimate elections of any kind are always based on a legal framework and a practical framework of implementation that is accepted <clears throat> by all of the stakeholders in an election and in looking at the legal framework perhaps first three general observations the first is <clears throat> that all of what i'll be saying today is based on knowing about common law in electoral systems in particular in the way in which the UK's uh, legal frameworks were historically con uh, constructed and developed. And that I know will go quite a long way in understanding Fiji's legislation and regulations, but it does not take into account any specific jurisprudence that's developed within Fiji or more widely in the in the Pacific yet and I'm sure that um, things may be found within that which may put a gloss on or point one or two of the things that I might be about to say in a different direction. The second is that like any legal commentary. It is a commentary. The actual uh, text of laws is fixed. The interpretation of those laws is definitively known when um, courts make decisions and, uh, and deliver judgment. So uh, there are things here which strongly appear to be the case, but which would uh, which would be subject possibly to being discussed within the Fijian court system, and perhaps finally being uh, pronounced on by the Supreme Court. And the third thing <clears throat> is that in any uh, political situation where there has been conflict um, uh, over a period of many years, 
Um, there's a lot of legislation about, and different laws have been put in place by different power holders and different interests at different times in the procedure. And that inevitably means that all stakeholders um, are possibly more sympathetic to some of those laws than to others. Uh, that's not something that can be reflected or taken into account in assessing the legal framework. Um, the legal, a legal framework assessment and the way in which the judiciary considers the legal framework has to work on the principle that all of the laws that are valid um, and have not been superseded are equal in status. So with those three um, overarching considerations, let me say a few things about the legal framework. Legal frameworks for, for local elections start with the Local Government Act of 1972 and of um, the subsidiary regulations uh, which are associated with it. And this is what formed the basis of previous municipal elections. Now that act remains in force, but the electoral aspects of it, um, of which there are not very many, there are four articles, um, four sections within it, which deal specifically with elections, um, contain quite a lot of things that look as if they are superseded by two more recent pieces of legislation, one of which is the Electoral Registration of Voters Act of 2012, and the other is the Electoral Act of 2014. Looking first at registration, coming at the beginning of the electoral process as the electoral cycle really kicks into gear. The core of the Registration of Voters Act of 2012 is the creation of the National Voter Register. And that's defined in the Act, it says it, which says that it's a register of persons entitled to vote at an election. Uh, so far, so good. Um, what does an election mean in this context? Uh, the Act tells us that it has the same meaning as in the Electoral Act um, in, of 2014. Switching over to look at that, section two, which is the definition section, says that election includes elections prescribed in section 154, and the provisions of section 154 specifically include municipal elections within that. And section 154 also makes the, the Fijian Elections Office responsible for them. This act make, in, contains an age for inclusion in the National Voting Voter Register, which is 18. And I understand that that's also been included in a recent decision of the Cabinet. Looking at all of these together, the provisions in the two newer acts are clearly not consistent with the voting age of 21 that um, is stated within the Local Government Act, nor is it consistent with the landowner franchise contained in that act. Uh, the the Local Government Act contains a provision in which uh, the, the, the owner of land, the ratepayer, can be registered as a voter as well. 
not surprising. It's something that used to exist in UK legislation until 1946. It's something that still exists in most of Australia. Um, but it's not a qualification for inclusion in the National Voter Register. And so it looks to me as if the old landowner ratepayer franchise that was contained in the Local Government Act has now been superseded and that there is one qualification to be registered as an elector on the NVR um, and that's laid down within that act um, and is essentially a residence-based qualification um, with some specific other considerations to be taken into account. Going on from registration to nomination to candidates who can be elected members, candidates have to be on the electoral register throughout all of the legislation. And that's a perfectly commonplace provision of qualification. Um, what is more interesting in current debate is the question of whether there's a retirement age for elected members. Um, there's nothing of this kind specified in the Local Government Act. Uh, and looking round at more general global practice, any provision of this kind would be highly unusual. The general view taken is that um, if people are old but no good, then the solution is not to vote for them, um, rather than to disqualify them from standing. Uh, it's not the same as the approach to um, civil servants of local authorities uh, who usually are subject to the same kind of formal retirement from employment provisions um, as civil servants nationally and indeed in parallel with employment legislation more generally. Next big interesting question from the Local Government Act is the electoral system and the, the traditional electoral system for Fijian municipalities is called the block vote. Um, the standard and established electoral system uh, gives each voter as many votes as there are vacancies and uses multi-member wards or, or districts. So if there are four vacancies, the voter can cast up to four X's for four of the up to four of the candidates on the ballot paper. And then the four candidates with the highest individual totals are the ones who are elected. Again, this is a well-known traditional system and it can work very well where all of the candidates are individuals contesting on their own merits and their own platforms and are not connected with each other. It has a <clears throat> possibly rather different effect when candidates start to come together to campaign on a common platform um, because if, if, if a group of candidates is saying, vote for all of us, use your four votes for the four of us working together, then what may happen is that the most popular individual group of that kind uh, has the four top votes and wins all the seats meaning that other viewpoints within the community get no representation at all. <clears throat> this is obviously something that may be linked to party-based tickets that emerge if political parties are standing in, in local elections. But it's not only based on parties. 
this is something that can equally well happen when there's a group of independents who are working together. Uh, this persuades me to ask the question, uh, is block vote in its traditional form something that will still work well for Fijian local authorities now in a context where inclusion may be of importance. Now to look at the actual structure of the new elected local authorities. And one of the problems that emerges from years without elected local government is that communities have moved on, even if the authorities haven't. Uh, the wards drawn within the existing city and town boundaries date back to um, times between 1972 and 2011, and I suspect that there's been a substantial change in population since. Uh, there are provisions that deal with this. The Electoral Commission has the power <clears throat> to determine council, the number of councillors for each ward, and this requires the issue of orders by the Electoral Commission. Um, there are many of the current orders uh, that are clearly published on, in Laws of Fiji, but it may well be that the balance of population between those different wards is now nothing like the same as it was when the wards were drawn. And so wards that gave one person one vote, one value when they were drawn may no longer be doing so. Uh, and that poses the question, uh, is it necessary um, to get back to something closer to one person, one vote, one value by changing the representation of wards? With multi-member wards, it's a lot easier to use existing ward boundaries and change the number of councillors that wards um, elect uh, to reflect the new population than it is to draw, to draw new ward boundaries, which is a, always a very difficult process to do in a way that produces outcomes that are accepted as legitimate and credible. The basic reason for this is that there's no technical method that will draw you politically neutral boundaries. That makes the new boundaries clearly a very sensitive field in which consultation and public participation are going to be essential. Now, this is really only the first part of the discussion about one person, one vote, one value. Because um, the question of peri-urban areas arises, the areas where people have moved to on the edge of the existing towns and cities outside the boundary, as those towns and cities have expanded as settlements as Fiji has become more urban. Uh, I tried to find some figures for this and the 2007 census is helpful in doing so. Um, in 2007, 65% of urban area population were within the town and city authority boundaries and 35% were in the peri-urban areas adjacent. Um, the 2017 census, as far as I could find, unfortunately doesn't have the, the same you know, data in it, um, but I suspect that peri-urban share has grown substantially since 2007. 
Now, what happens now in peri-urban areas? Authorities can deliver services on a contract basis, but there's clearly no democratic input or accountability to that. And there are questions about the clarity and the um, availability of funding. There is a provision that requires authorities to provide services to Itake villages within the boundaries. Um, this looks to be a huge area um, of discussion, potentially. Uh, I'm guessing from peri-urban areas generally that there may be all sorts of patterns of formal and informal service delivery involving all sorts of people in peri-urban areas, um, some of which are funded, some of which are not, some of which are formal, some of which are not, and that this is again going to be a field in which consultation and public participation and discussion are vital in acceptance of new boundaries and uh, of authorities. Uh, if you are going to extend authority boundaries, there is a procedure for it in the Local Government Act with a publication of a notice, with an objection period, with advice and publication of advice by the Local Government Committee, appeals and then potentially appeals to the High Court on a question of law. Um, the significant thing about this is that it's a procedure that um, takes you potentially a minimum of three and a half months from publishing an initial notice to the Minister being able to issue an order um, which establishes the extension of the authority boundaries. When you've done that, again, going back to the 35% uh, now probably rather more population who live in peri-urban areas, uh, it may be that warding arrangements are needed within the newly incorporated areas too and the Electoral Commission has powers on um, to do this but again it's a process that will take time and take uh, take discussion. Now a few thoughts on implementation um, and actually conducting elections. First thing is that this is not as I think it was once a local authority function. Um, it's, a, it's a job of the Fijian Elections Office. Um, the Electoral Commission has the power to make rules. Um, the minister responsible for elections can make regulations to prescribe rules and procedures. And the, um, the Local Government Act needs to be harmonised as far as possible with the procedures in the Electoral Act. Uh, this is an area that clearly needs some work and thought because some parts of the Electoral Act are quite specific to parliamentary elections. Um, the electoral system for, for Parliament is very different and so the provisions for nominations are different. Um, the provisions for ballot paper layout certainly um, don't apply to block vote. Um, the campaign rule is different. The counting and declaration um, is different. There are some parts, however, which can work for municipal elections. The sections on polling arrangements will work. The sections on postal voting and pre-poll voting um, look as if they will work. 
And then there are some further sections which are uh, rather in the middle. Um, in some cases, the Electoral Act has um, made specific new provisions that don't appear in the old Local Government Act framework. Um, very evidently, the ability for observers to be present at the poll and at the count is permitted by the Electoral Act, but not in the previous Local Government framework. I suspect that the most important thing to say here is not only you know, what one says generally about standards for electoral legislation, but that clarity and consistency of interpretation is going to be important throughout which parts of the familiar procedure from parliamentary elections can and will be used, um, which parts can't, um, what are the uh, new provisions that will be used in those areas. The Election Commission powers are to formulate policy and oversee the conduct of elections. Um, the actual conduct of elections by the supervisor of elections, um, supported by the Fijian Electoral Office, uh, includes municipal elections. Again, that's uh, specified within the Act. Um, looking at an indicative implementation timeline, that suggests that on the actual practical side, there may be a base need of about eight months from starting the first activity on the ground, which looks like probably recruitment of trainers, to polling day. But there's nothing in the, in the formal election timetable that suggests in the later stages that it can't mirror the timetable that parliamentary elections uses, use, including the 45-day period between the issue of the writ and the budget. Also, elections cost money. Uh, Parliament needs to ensure, and the Electoral Act makes it Parliament's job to ensure that the Fijian Elections Office has a has a budget to uh, to conduct elections. So those overall are a few thoughts and considerations of the legalities and the practicalities in going down a very important road. Um, it's not an easy process because there's a great deal of detail in it, as there is in putting any election together. Um, most people, including a lot of people in the political system, don't really think about those details most of the time and leave them to experts uh, in corners. And it's also sometimes true that what people intuitively but intuitively believe about organizing elections and conducting elections isn't as easy as it looks or isn't always true. Um, I hope that these thoughts add to the consultation, the participatory process, the discussion that will help gain the kind of acceptance by stakeholders across the board that can make the upcoming local elections credible, legitimate, and a new start for elected local democracy in Fiji. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that sub substantive um, presentation, giving us a lot of food for thought. I'll hand over to Madam PS, uh, Ms. Seema Sharma for her presentation and for her response. Thank you, Seema. Okay.
Th thank you very much, Anna. And um, I must say that uh, uh, that presentation was very, very comprehensive. Um, and it did outline a number of issues that we are also contemplating on um, and very aptly captured, captured in the international idea um, uh, paper that they had presented. Um, I don't have a, a detailed presentation as as um, uh, Andrew does, but I will try and sort of um, go through a few of the issues that we have been considering. And and I must say, all all most of my issues have been and um, sort of addressed or been brought to the fore by um, by Andrew in his um, presentation. Um, and a number of things, obviously, we, we want to sort of go back and and, and the, look at the whole idea as to why, you know, we need to have these these elections. In Fiji, obviously, you haven't had um, elections since uh, municipal council elections since 2005. That was the last time a um, a full fledged, you know, having all the 13 municipalities covered. You know, there were different times when it was held because back then, it was not as very uh, correctly pointed out by Andrew, it was not sort of run by a single authority. It was as in when the councils decided to have the elections. Um, a number of things back then obviously did not happen according to how rules and regulations were put in place. Um, you know, there have been certain discrepancies with, which obviously led to almost every time there was an election, there would be a dispute put in put in court, um, you know, and it, it election results were disputed, or you know, even even the voter registration was disputed. Um, Andrew pointed out right correctly um, under Section Eleven of the Act, um, you know, it does specify you know who can be the voter and you know what 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 are the requirements. At, at this point in time, yes, it is inconsistent with the Electoral Act. Uh, in and the constitution when it comes to the age and 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 um cabinet in January sort of gave instructions in that area to say look um we need to review the the age and sort of bring it consistent with the constitution and you know how how voters at, at the national level there is obviously still again a, a a requirement of owner or occupier um which is quite broad um then again quite limiting because it does say if there's a person who's an occupier, he or she can only be elected as a voter if the occupier is in legal occupation. So according to you know, international norms, that is a bit restrictive because it does eliminate certain people who are residents of a, of a municipality from um, being elected. So when, when we look at the role of a, of, a, of a municipal council, we would say, okay, what is their role? Their role is obviously they're the part, the, the, the topmost and highest um, governing body of a municipality. And their job is obviously to provide services to people who sort of, um, or, or look at the interest of people who live within um, uh, towns and cities. Um, some of the things when people think about municipal councils is as, um, you know, that their job is to do with garbage collection, you know, that they have to make sure that they look after the beautification of the towns and cities. But one of the things that is forgotten is, is that the municipal councils actually is your conduit to economic growth. If your councils are not going to function properly, if the systems and processes are not similar or consistent, you will have issues. If their processes are not transparent, you will, um, you know, you won't have businesses thriving. You will not be able to create economic activity within those municipalities. So these are obviously some of the very critical policy consideration that has to be taken on board when we're working towards, you know, developing what systems and processes need to be put in place. So in 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 terms of, um, you know, the findings of the paper, it's it's very much. Uh, and very much appreciated, I must say, that you know, for I international idea to present these findings to us, um, because um, it it does help give a a independent um, um, opinion or an independent view of how everything looks, and very much of what we do sort of um, identify as critical issues, the inconsistencies in the law. Um, the areas that need to be reviewed. Um, you know, we've we've gone through all 13 municipalities as of last night. We've had a series of consultations. We've had a lot of feedback. 
and mm -hmm. focusing as as Andrew had po pointed out some of the you know he's actually pointed out the three or four critical areas that we've been also going out and consulting on this was your elector your voter registration your criteria for the candidates your electoral system and also looking at um, you know what what uh, you know other areas that we could look at is even looking at um, you know, nomination um, procedures, you know, how, um, you know, there were feedback that we've received saying that, oh, um, you know, uh, what, what uh, would party politics be involved? So if you look at the current act, it doesn't actually specify parties, because you're required to nominate people. And the nomination process is obviously six to eight people within the ward, would nominate you, you know, and, and these are six to eight electors. So people who are able to register as an elector would be the people nominating, say, a me to 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 contest the elections, provided I, I and then obviously there'll be a scrutiny done whether I, I qualify or not. So, but, you know, it it means individuals, if you look at the act, but, you know, there is always ways of, of going about that that yeah. that system. So, you know, we've had a lot of questions in that area, you know, whether whether, part, whether we should specify. I mean, just last night, the, the people in Lemmy were very passionate about it. They had a very strong view. Um, there was, there's been a lot of discussions about, as, as you know, saying, you know, the, the growth of the peri urban areas around, um, around Fiji. Um, and also within a number of municipalities, the growth of informal settlements who are within town boundaries, how do we treat them in this whole process? A, lump, a number of hows, what, and how, and, 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 how, uh, and what it's gonna take us to do. So obviously um, following cabinet's decision, we had sort of, and the, 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 the directive from cabinet was first looking at um, the, um, uh, the processes, looking at the um, voter age, looking at even the term of council, because there was at one point where the act said the term of council is four years. Then it was amended and then brought down to three years. Cabinet has obviously given us instructions to say that it should um, you know, go out and consult on it, but it should, it should be sort of consistent with the national uh, process, you know, making it four years. Obviously, we don't want to cause confusion where you know elections happen at the same time, but you know they 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 it's 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 a consistent process with the with the national elections. Uh, a lot of policy um, um, considerations that we need to sort of from today take into consideration before we prepare a roadmap um, for cabinet. So our job as 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 the ministry, and we're not working in isolation. We've got a working group that was actually established by cabinet which is chaired by the, the Permanent Secretary of Local Government and has the key implementing agencies, which is over the elections office, um, the finance people, the Solicitor General's office that's gonna help us amend and all the municipality CEOs, because we wanna make sure that whatever data information that we're using are up to date, they're able to tell us how things sort of happen in their towns and cities and what are some of the critical consideration. So, and it obviously does allow the working group to get support of CSOs or development partners. In this process, obviously, we've got two, uh, three working uh, sort of operational groups that are working towards the process of developing a roadmap to elections. And these include the drafting group that has actually gone out and gotten feedback from stakeholders. We also have... Um, um, a group that looks at logistics, which is going to look at, you know, the cost, how we're going to go about, what are going to be the timelines. And the third group actually looks at policies, guidelines, and codes of conduct. It's been almost two decades since the last elections were held. And, um, and then, you know, um, in order for, for, um, for councils to sort of get used to this. I mean, there have been special administrators, but the way the way they were conducting themselves were very different. You know, from three, if you look at Suva, you're gonna have 20 people. If we, you know, it's, it's from two to three to 20. So, which is a big jump, you know, a, a, a big difference. And, you know, you're having a mayor, having, you know, your councillors who are gonna be more involved 
in a number of things in terms of policy. So we need to set the codes of conduct and also looking at what would be the baseline um, um, policies that should be given, the basic guidelines when it's to do with financial management, project management, looking at um, anti-corruption laws, uh, oh, sorry, policies, and, and a number of other things. So there are three tracks sort of run, running simultaneously um, at the moment. And we um, have had feedback that maybe we should get these policies and and you know code of conducts all sorted before we go to elections. Um, obviously, that that we a, a presentation that we'll be giving to cabinet. There's been a lot of recommendations on a number of areas, but following these consultations in in the thirteen municipalities, which we sort of completed um, yesterday as of last night. Um, you know, uh, we um, we will um, be going back to the to 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 the working group with the different uh, recommendations that we've received, sort of pointing out the pros and cons of it, and then the the, the, the working group working towards a a detailed roadmap um, that would be submitted with a cabinet paper to cabinet to give us further instructions. A lot of people have asked us questions. When is the elections going to happen? We've told them we cannot tell them right now because it's a decision of cabinet. There has been some dates being flagged around in media, and and, and but we the, if, if the final decision of when the elections are going to be held would have to be made by cabinet. Our job obviously has to be to ensure that we give the best policy adv advice to cabinet to make sure that as as has been concluded by Andrew, we have to have a fair, a transparent and an and appropriate election for councils. It's not elections for the sake of having elections. It's making sure it achieves what we, um, what the coalition government has set out to do. It's making sure that the people are able to choose who sits in their councils, who become their representatives, and they are easily able to, you know, um, say, look, um, they are, you know, they are chosen by us. So there's no, there's no complaints. You know, they, they have to serve us and, 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 and whatever plans they make, it is, uh, the people feel very close to it. So that's the whole idea of, of making sure that, you know, these elections happen in, in a, in a, very, in a very free fair and, and, and transparent manner. So um, that's a, my little contribution to the discussions today. Um, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity um, to being part of this panel today. And I'm, I'm looking forward to having good discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, P.S. Uh, Seema, for your contribution and adding to the food for thought that we've got to kind of go over in our discussions this morning. I'll hand over to Nilesh, the Executive Director for Dialogue Fiji. Mr. Nilesh Lal, over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Sorry, Nilesh, you're still on mute. Do you want to unmute, please? Oh. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, very good morning to everybody that is joining. Now, one of the drawbacks of being the last speaker is that uh, the people before you uh, cover uh, everything that you wanted to talk talk on. So I've had to change my speaking notes uh, midway because obviously Andrew was very comprehensive. Um, However, there are some very salient points that uh, uh, that uh, Andrew raised, which cannot be overemphasized. We have the, the situation where we um, want to have elections after a very long time. The government has uh, uh, expressed its intent to hold elections. In fact, the civil society has been agitating for it for a very long time. But what is very important, however, is that... Uh, uh, the elections are conducted properly and uh, uh, some of the timelines that have been uh, uh, provided so far or some of the dates that have been uh, uh, given are definitely not realistic because there's a lot of things that will need to be done before we can actually hold elections in Fiji after such a long time. Um, 
of course, you know, one of the most critical things would be the um, the choice of electoral system. Now, we have the situation where there's a new constitutional order. There's also a new electoral framework that we're operating under. And as Andrew has very aptly uh, pointed out, there might be a lot of conflicts that the um, existing legislation, which appears to be, I mean, existing legislation governing local government elections, which appears to be the Local Government Ele um, Act of 1972, um, might have been superseded in, in different, um, in various respects by, by the constitution. They might no longer, I mean, provisions might no longer be in tandem with the, the new constitution. Uh, and then uh, there are certain sections that might have been actually superseded by the new uh, electoral act. So obviously these are some of the matters that will need to be clarified because you can't hold elections with that uh, amount of uncertainties about what the, uh, the laws, the legislative provisions um, are in relation to, uh, to those. So that will obviously need to happen. And that is something that we cannot entirely trust political actors to, uh, to uh, with. Uh, electoral system design is uh, a exercise that needs an, a whole of society approach. Um, um, of course, you know, political, if political actors were to do it themselves, they could very well devise a system that will uh, advance their political agendas that would obviously uh, increase the prospects of those in powers of um, you know further consolidating control and so forth so that is why it is absolutely critical that uh, electoral system design in particular is something that is done properly now the electoral system that we have under the uh, local government act of 1972 is a block vote system and uh, block vote systems, which are essentially priority systems, may not exactly be the most desirable. Uh, I mean, they might not lead to the most desirable outcomes for a ethnically polarized society like Fiji. Um, uh, and in fact, we have seen it happen in the past where there was dominance of one or two parties based on race, of course. So, um, I hope you know that is something that can be uh, properly uh, debated upon in the public sphere, and that is something. Uh, I mean, I would personally favor a a move towards a PR system, which essentially is the system that we're all also using for parliamentary elections in PG, and there are many advantages of adopting a PR system. One of which, of course, is that then the local government elections save as a training grounds for um, uh, for uh, the national elections. One of the things that we've seen happen recently, I mean, in the last elections, is that there has been a very significant reduction in the number of uh, women uh, members of parliament. In fact, we've gone from a high of 21.6% in, uh, I think, 2021 uh, to just, you know, just around 11% in this new parliament after that was retained after the last elections. So there is something that we need to be very concerned about. And just because the stakes are arguably lower in uh, uh, local government elections, uh, political parties, which I still believe will be the, the, the main uh, one of, the, I mean, the key stakeholders in uh, local government elections, uh, political parties perhaps would be more inclined to uh, include more women candidates. And then, you know, there can be special programs that can be run to ensure that we are able to groom female candidates for, for uh, the national parliament. So um, the, there's a lot of opportunities that we have um, uh, in the current context. You know, and if the political will is there, if there's a will to do the right thing, I think uh, we should be able to devise a electoral system that would serve the best interest of all Fijians. And uh, and I hope that is how things will eventually turn out to be. Now, there's absolutely no way we can hold elections in September. Uh, it has been um, reported in the media that the government intends to do so. Um, 
as uh, Andrew has alluded to, there obviously need to be budget reallocations down to the region elections. Obviously, I think it will cost somewhere around 10 to $20 million for us to conduct um, elections for the 13 municipalities that exist in Fiji. Um, and then, but before we get down to administering the elections, there's a lot of groundwork that will need to happen. Um, and this is something that cannot be just done overnight. Um, there has to be involvement of experts like Andrew, for instance, there has to be involvement of uh, uh, local interest groups um, in, in the entire process. Uh, so um, I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very much important that um, we uh, seize this opportunity and be able to um, ensure that when we eventually do hold elections, that they are actually able uh, to lead to a context, I mean, lead to a situation where uh, the, um, the, um, where, where democracy is the winner, where the quality of governance that follows of, uh, also improves, and, uh, and then we have a system that is representative of the people's will, that is, you know, that ensures transparency, accountability, that empowers communities to participate in local decision making. And uh, it also mm -hmm. uh, is mindful of uh, the divisions that we have in society, uh, the the other dynamics pertaining to race and so forth, so that uh, we, we, um, we end up, it leads to municipal councils that are very inclusive, that are very diverse in nature. So that's my contribution to, to uh, today's discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nilesh. Uh, wonderful contributions from all of our three panelists this morning, giving us a lot of food for thought around the legalities, the practicalities, um, also the opportunities that are being provided right now um, and I like the way that uh, Nilesh particularly picked up on and spoke about the representation of women and how do we use the local government process as an opportunity to get more women into um, the national, into parliament. So what we're going to do is just open up, uh, we've got a couple of questions that have come in via the chat. So if it's all right with the panelists, I'll just go straight to the questions and then invite you to, to share your thoughts again. Um, in, in just responding to some of the, the questions that are coming up from those who are tuning in this morning. So the first question is from Solomon Edwin and it's directed to Andrew, looking at the number of gaps in the laws. I think you might've spoken to this a little bit afterwards, but maybe just to go over it, Andrew, how long do you think it will take to set all the laws in order to conduct the elections effectively? Right. Thank you for that that question. It's quite it's quite a difficult question to answer because um, the the key to this is the amount of time that it takes for the different stakeholders um, to uh, discuss and you know, for some kind of consensus to be reached, if possible, and then the time that it takes the government and the cabinet and parliament uh, to pass uh, all of the legislation changes that emerge. Following on from that, there are clearly also some you know, lower level regulation things that are required. Uh, anything to do with um, uh, expanding boundaries to take in peri-urban areas. I talked about the, the timetable for that, for example. Um, there are a few minor points which need to be dealt with, um, not at government level necessarily, uh, but certainly at electoral commission or equivalent level. Um, one example is that the Raki Raki town was, as far as I can see, created in 2010, um, which means that it was never set up with a council. 
and so presumably somebody has to decide and put a piece of regulation in place that determines the existence of the council and um, how many members it should have and what the warding arrangement um, for, that, for, for that will be. So difficult to give um, a definite answer and also uh, difficult to take into account the fact that where there are different interests involved, the usual dynamics of such processes is that nothing moves for a long time and then suddenly in the last stages of discussions a huge number of things all get settled very very quickly up against a deadline or even actually after a practical deadline Wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so the response is there's no definite answer. It's difficult to given all the all the all the challenges. So our, our next question um, is from Vicky Prakash, and it's to all three panelists. So how sure can the municipal elections in Fiji take place without political influence and interference? And that's a question for all three, um, just to get your views. Yeah, well, I think it's a, invariably a political process, right? Um, but if, if the person means that, uh, you know, there would be undue influence by political actors, well, that will all depend on what are the safeguards in the system. So um, uh, giving ministers, giving uh, the minister extensive powers, wide ranging powers obviously will have an impact on this. So I think these are some of the things that can be um, looked at in the new, uh, I mean, if there's a amendment of the act. Um, however, if uh, there's an independent body like the Fijian Elections Office that would be responsible for the process, then I don't think there would be undue uh, political influence. But everything, I mean, a lot of it will depend on the uh, electoral framework. Would any of the other panelists like to contribute to that question? Um, yes, I'm, I generally agree with what Nilesh has just said, because um, when local government was first set up, and I think this is not unique to Fiji, then it was in fact practical for the discussion surrounding communities and local elections to really take place primarily or almost exclusively um, at local level in a world in which there are um, a lot more communications um, in which um, there's continuous media activity and reporting in which there are social media channels um, I think it's actually not practical to think that you can conduct a, a local authority or a local election within a bubble um, that excludes the wider political process. Um, that in fact is even more the case uh, when a lot of what local authorities do under the existing legislation has to then go up to the ministry as well and so the question is how one develops procedures codes of conduct um, and at a deeper level divisions of power between um, local authorities national authorities and others uh, that makes those external influences um, rather more controlled uh, the I think the days in which you could um, exclude external influence entirely um, have gone and won't come back. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Andrew. Um, okay, so our next 
to Seema, did you want to PS, Madam PS, did you have any response to that? No, uh, thanks, thanks, Anna. I think Nilesh and Andrew have sort of answered that question quite well, so I, I don't have anything else to add. Thank you. Need for procedures, divisions of power, putting in, making sure that the safeguards are in place. <laughs> So this question is directed to you, Madam PS. So what are the, what's the general feeling from the public in relations to the local government elections? Are they looking forward to it? Um, and is the ministry also looking at developing guidelines for councils to help in their day-to-day -day operations? Thanks, thanks for that question, Anna. Um, oh, yeah, the, the, um, as we've gone around and, and spoke, spoken to people in, in public consultations, there's, there's a lot of enthusiasm. Everyone's actually very much looking forward to um, uh, these, these uh, local government elections. Um, and they have had their say, you know, they definitely had their say as to what we should look at, how we should look at things in terms of when we're gonna go back to drafting. Um, because what we presented to them was as is, you know, what the current systems and processes are, we want your view. So it was taking in all the views and recommendations and then going back and looking at how things would be drafted. But there's there's been a lot of enthusiasm and it, it feels good from, from everyone that we've sort of met and, and spoken to. Um, in terms of um, developing guidelines, um, I, I did mention that it was a specific pool that was looking into these details, a, a, a specific working group. And we are um, appreciative of the support that have actually gotten from the Commonwealth Local Government Forum in drafting the guidelines and the code of conduct. Um, as um, you know, there has to be clear demarcation of the role of the mayors and the councillors and the role that of the CEO or what previously used to be called town clerks. Um, it has to be, you know, what, how, how the council needs to function and how do, and, and then basically how the operations of things happen. So whatever policy or you know, strategic um, direction are given, you know, whatever is approved by the, the council, how does it sort of translate into day-to-day -day operations? So we have to make sure that those things are very clear to avoid any conflicts in future. Um, we will do obviously our best to get it perfect, but you know, as, as we go, but as we said, we, we're gonna make sure that these um, policies and guidelines are, are consistent. We, if you if you have a, a look at the, the current regulations, every council sort of had their own systems and processes regulated <clears throat> to how a council conducted itself. But we wanna make sure we, create a consistent um uh at least a consistent platform so yeah they're definitely going to be guidelines being developed thank you thank you very much uh ps so the next question is to nilesh do you think the local government elections should happen at party line well that has always been the case in fiji um so but actually the question is a rather complex one and there might be different opinions on the matter. Uh, for, for instance, on one hand, uh, people might argue that party-based um, local government elections can provide clarity to voters on the political platforms and my, uh, maybe ideologies of different parties, mm, which will make it easier for parties to gain a majority in the uh, local uh, uh, government. Also, party-based um, uh, local government elections may also help to promote uh, accountability as parties would be held uh, responsible for their performance in office. On the other hand, uh, some might argue that party-based uh, local government elections can create division and polarization in local communities, as political parties may prioritize their own interests over those of the communities. It can also uh, limit the number of candidates or the range of candidates that can be elected, as parties may only nominate candidates that conform to the party line rather than individuals with the uh, you know, unique and uh, uh, diverse, maybe unconventional perspectives. Um, now, one of the drawbacks, obviously, of having PR system is that uh, the uh, independent candidates will uh, have a lower chances of uh, electoral success. Um, and so, um, yeah. But I think uh, if you uh, consider the history of local government elections in Fiji, what we can definitely expect is that it will be fought on party lines. Yeah, thank you very much, Nilesh. Yes, um, 
Okay, so the next question, why does the government want to organize the municipal elections as soon as possible? I would assume that's been directed to us. <laughs> um, uh, Anna, just to say, I, I don't think 18 years is is soon. It's been a while since the last municipal council elections have been held. Um, they, the fact is, it's it's about making sure that, you know, uh, the 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 commitment of the of the coalition government is to make sure that you know the the um, responsibility of the municipalities' highest governing body should be put back to the councillors and those councillors who are elected by the people. I think that was the whole idea. Even if you looked at the act and that section that was brought in around two thousand eight or nine that looked at the appointment of special administrators, also has a provision in it that the day. Um, the electoral commission announces the date of elections the special administrators cease to operate um so the the the, the there has been um you know it's 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 the government's um intention to make sure that the people of 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 uh, of this uh, of this country are able to choose their own municipal council representatives who their representatives are at the level so i don't think um 18 years is 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 as a soon process it's been a while so you know it's 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 about time the process needs to start thank you thank you very much uh, ps so this is i think more of a comment that's come from the floor from rajesh kumar there needs to be political will to expedite municipal elections as it's been long overdue for the sake of accountability transparency and good governance procedures so i think that just kind of reiterates the point that you've made ps We've got another question from um, Mr. Satish Kumar. Funding um, for the for the for the funding for the council is by ratepayers generally. Shouldn't the affairs of the councils be exclusively decided by the ratepayers? If not, then all those who vote and have a say in the affairs of the council by paying as well, include including residents and informal occupants. Not sure if that if that question uh, makes sense. Does it um, to any of the panelists? So funding is generally by the ratepayers. Shouldn't the affairs of councils be exclusively decided by the ratepayers? If not, then all those who vote and have a say in the affairs of the council should be paying as well, including including residents and informal occupants. Yes, that 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 does make sense as a question. Um, and it, it's actually a, a very important debate as to who is who is responsible for paying for services. Um, if it is the desire of the government um, that people should be able to choose their own representatives, um, then the usual interpretation of people is rather wider than just ratepayers and there's while you can construct a, log a logic in which all services are paid for only by their users only those who um, have children pay for education services and schools only those who are sick pay for doctors and hospitals and so on, um, which is very much a, an individual responsibility rather than a community responsibility. Um, it is a principle that uh, usually does not work anything like as well, because those who actually need the services are probably going to be in the least good position to be able to pay for them um, at the point when they need them. Now, when Satish Kumar says that uh, if it's not decided exclusively by the ratepayers, if it is decided by the people, by the community, because it is a community responsibility to provide services for the community as a whole, even though not all the members of the community 
will be using all of those services at any one time, then yes, that might well down the track point to a funding mechanism for local authorities that does not um, find itself restricted to the paying of rates. Um, there may be a, a different funding base for people as a whole. And there's also the question of local authorities being able to charge for um, certain services that, that they might deliver. Uh, that I suspect is a discussion down the track rather than a discussion for the um, holding of local elections in the immediate future but it is certainly a discussion that could take place. Thank you, Andrew. Did, did uh, PS, did you have something you wanted to contribute to that? Um, uh, thanks, thanks, Anna. I think that has been a, a, an area of discussion during most of our consultations, as I had pointed out, the, the bit about you know the occupier and the owner. And there were a lot of, um, there's been sort of, Two, two sides of the whole thing. A lot, there's been a lot of um, feedback about um, that all residents should be allowed to vote, whether you're a rate payer or not, whilst there's been strong objections that only rate payers should vote. But the act currently does not say rate payers. It's, it's quite open and, and, and um, it's a broad. But obviously, these are things that we will be taking into consideration and the feedback when, when making recommendations back to cabinet about drafting. Thank you. Thank you very much, PS. We've just had uh, Nilesh has had to excuse himself to run off to another appointment. So thank you, Nilesh, um, for your wonderful contributions this morning. We've got lots of questions coming in. So if it's okay with um, PS and Andrew, if we could just work through the next couple of questions and see how we go. I don't know whether we'll be able to get through everything before we wrap up at 10.30, but if it's all right with, the, with the Andrew and Seema, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, so the next question is, um, from Cho Nasa, who just asks, you know, that this says this would be a great opportunity for young people to participate in the democratic process in politics. Will there be a need again for political parties to register for the election on the municipal elections? Um, That's is the it question. Okay, I yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, definitely, um, Chanasa has a very good point with regards to the fact that. Um, uh, it would be great for youth to participate. Um, and we definitely want youth participation. Um, you know, one of the important things that actually Nilesh had highlighted about, you know, representation of women, but we've also had feedback um, during the consultations about setting up quotas, not just for women, but, you know, for the youth, people of disabilities, the marginalized society, you know, so having maybe like a quota set aside. Um, but, you know, obviously these are things that need to be considered with a number of other uh, policy consideration. Um, we also have, um, you know, we were actually looking forward for a lot, lot more youth participation at, at the consultations, but wherever the youth did participate, they did really had, uh, they, they really had a lot of um, things to contribute to and a lot of very good ideas. So as we go, as we've gone around this first round of consultations, and as we move towards, um, you know, the, the the drafting and other other processes, drafting the roadmap and stuff, there will be other opportunity where the youth can contribute, and we look forward to the youth participating in in, in these elections when they happen, because as an elector, your your um, voting age is obviously could be brought down to eighteen. So that means that you could be one of the people who could qualify to to be part of of um, be a candidate for the council. So. Um, definitely, you know, the youth is the future. With regards to the need for political parties to register, that obviously would be a decision made further down the line as to how things unfold and whether, you know, the relevant act of the, um, you know, the elections office, the the party registration, or, you know, um, or the whether that would sort of have an impact in terms of the drafting of regulations for, for the uh, municipal council elections. Thank you. Um, 
May I add to that that there's, it occurs to me that there may be a link to the previous discussion here, because I would guess that a lower proportion of young people are ratepayers um, than is true of people as a whole. And so one of the reasons that may point towards um, adopting all, all citizens who are registered as the electorate is that that includes young people in a way in which a ratepayer only franchise of any kind would not. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, uh, for making that connection back to the to the to the earlier question. Um, we're seven, we're you know going into we're fastly reaching our time limit in terms of the 9, 10.30 Fiji time. So I've just maybe just one more question. Um, and this is from Aman. Um, Aman Naf, thank you. So he's thank thank you to all the respected panelists for your profound contributions. Local government elections have been convened after a lapse of 18 years. The dynamics have changed considerably. As one has alluded, a new electoral system and constitutional arrangement is in place. Which electoral system would be conducive in the upcoming local government elections? And having constituency-based wards or open list proportional system? And this is a question for any of the panelists who would like to respond. Maybe Andrew? Yes. If you are taking a, a, a decision that the, um, the political environment and the way in which communities in Fiji now work mean that there will be um, groupings of people, you know, whether formalized as, through parties or not, fighting elections, then that does make a case uh, for uh, looking at alternatives to block vote. Um, if the aim is to encourage inclusion and for the new local authorities to work in the interests of the whole community and be accepted by the whole community, then it's important to emphasize principles of, in, uh, uh, of inclusion, then yes, you are looking at developing some form of um, proportional system. And given that you know, people in local elections do very definitely wish to support individual candidates and not only parties or tickets, um, then yes, that would probably need to be an open list system of some kind. So there's a policy discussion here as to what is appropriate for representation generally. And there's then a technical discussion to design the details of that system uh, to, meet what the, to, to meet the outcomes. Uh, it, that's something that will take a little bit of time, um, but with some views of uh, what the political needs are, it would turn out to be important. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. Just just uh, highlighting there the the very technical aspects of deciding on a, on a on a local on a on a, on a appropriate system, which in response to that question. So we've got one more minute, but I I think I just want to read out a one a question that's come in from one of the one of the participants this morning, who's um, Dr. Mosmi Bim, who's saying I express concerns as why some people are regarding politics and political with negative views. The reality is that politics is a part of everyday life and each advocacy activity about allocation of goods and services is political. So politics is not just about political parties and this needs to be explained to the electorate. So th that's, I think, um, is a statement from Moshmi. Um, thank you, Moshmi, for that statement. And maybe just one more question for Madam PS as we come to 10.30 before we, we wrap up. 
what are the next steps after local consultations and perhaps some timelines on the next activities? I think you went through this in your, in your presentation, but maybe you would just like to, to um, provide that before we wrap up this morning. Thanks for the question, Anna. Um, so we are in the process now um, developing, oh, well, developing a, a, a paper to the working group, which will then, you know, go through the recommendations, decide on what, you know, how it's going to be presented back to cabinet for, because we need to get back to cabinet with a, a roadmap mm -hmm. of what will be done, what are the processes, so it's the drafting, the registrations, the awareness, and a number of other activities. At this point in time, I definitely cannot give you what could be timelines, because um, I don't want to preempt what the decision of cabinet would be. I mean, I could give you timelines, but then, you know, cabinet would have its own decision. So at this point in time, um, I will not be able to give you timelines, but there is definitely a, a draft ready in terms of how we're going to go about all the processes. But as as and when obviously cabinet makes a decision, um, it, it is, uh, you know, cabinet does make it sort of public as to what the processes would be. So people will be informed in advance of how the processes will go about. So thank you. Thank you very much, Madam PS. Okay, so we're 10.31, so we'll bring it to a close. We're not able to go through all of the questions, but I just expressed um, appreciation to all of the participants who have sent in some questions this morning. Um, I think what we'll try and do with IDEA is, is take all the questions down and find a way of uh, communicating this response through the work that IDEA does um, in, 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 in the Pacific and in Fiji. And I guess just as we wrap up, there's a statement from um, one of the panelists or one of the web, sorry, one of the participants who's saying, this is not a question, just an expression of my deep appreciation for the panelists for the wonderful discussion, which has now broadened my understanding on elections in general. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you, PS. Um, and we'll now bring it to a close and just some closing remarks. International Ideas Asia and the Pacific Regional Office again would like to thank all the speakers and the audience for joining this live event. And we sincerely hope that through the discussions that everybody's people have gained knowledge about local government elections. And I think one of our participants has said that and what to envisage in the coming months. Um, and we ask that you please look out for dates for the next webinar and we look forward again to your active engagement and what we will try to do is just pull out all the questions this session is being recorded pull out all the questions and find ways in which we can communicate that back to um to everybody who's joined us but thank you andrew thank you madam ps for just the um, wonderful lots of food for thought around just the complexities of uh, having local government elections given the announcement that has so-called been made for September and October, looking at how very practical or impractical that may be, some of the challenges with the, the legislation, but also I think some of the opportunities which are provided to us, particularly for, you know, as we go through this, this time. Um, and particularly, I think, because I'm a gender person, for more women's representation in local government elections, and hopefully that will lead to more representation at the national level. So sincerely, Renaka Vagalevu, thank you for the um, wonderful discussion, and we look forward to the next one. And thank you to all our part uh, participants who have joined us. Have a good day, and uh Manda. Naka. Thank you, Andrew. Much appreciated. Thank you, P.S. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Sima. Thanks, Tana. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you, Have a good day. <laughs> Have a good day. Yeah. Bye. -bye.